In the seemingly quiet town of Derry, which sits beside the Penobscot River that winds through central Maine, historians have noticed a pattern of horrible things happening every 27 years. One such historian, Michael Hanlon, hoped that the darkness would not reawaken on schedule in 1984, so he was most disappointed to learn of the fate of Adrian Mellon in July of that year. Mike hoped that the Adrian Mellon incident was an isolated one, but it would soon become clear that Adrian had been just the first victim of what had become known as the Derry Cycle, a cycle that Mike had seen began once before in his lifetime with the untimely demise of six-year-old George Denbrough. To learn how Adrian's case was linked to Georgie, Henry Bowers, and ultimately it, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. There are probably thousands of characters in Stephen King's 1986 novel, It. So even with multiple long film adaptations, it's difficult to do them all justice. In the case of Mellon, that is, Adrian Mellon, he didn't even make an appearance in the 1990 miniseries, It, despite having an entire chapter dedicated to him in the book. He would show up for the 2019 movie, It, Chapter 2. The character was inspired by a real victim named Charlie Howard, who was thrown over a bridge while walking with his male partner after being harassed by three teenagers teenagers about his sexuality. This took place in Bangor, Maine, which the fictional town of Derry, Maine is heavily based on. The real life case and the fictional case are almost exactly alike in every detail except for the end. Charlie Howard ended up drowning in the Kandusky stream, but Adrian Mellon would face a much darker fate. To understand his story, I'm going to take it all the way back to his birth, but before I do, let me really quickly tell you about this episode's sponsor, Raycon. As an owner of Raycon earbuds, let me just say that everybody always wants to try out and borrow my pair. It's easy to see why. I mean, today I was listening to the song, It Is The End, and it sounds like you're in the studio with the band. It's easy to see why musicians like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, and Brandy are obsessed with Raycon. These everyday E25 earbuds are their best offering, with seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and great color options, which by the way, I recommend you go now because the popular color options are really going fast. You can also get 15% off if you use my link, buyraycon.com slash CZ's World. So go get your own damn pair. That's buyraycon.com slash CZ's World. Adrian Mellon was born in October of 1951. Like another IT victim, Eddie Kasprach, he had a bad case of asthma. But unlike Eddie, he wasn't always very careful to protect himself from danger, and he would one day be described as one of those fools who think things really are going to turn out all right. The fact that Adrian was only 5'5", 135 in adulthood didn't exactly make up for his lack of protective coloration. Adrian was, like so many Stephen King characters, a writer. He graduated from college in 1972 and went on to write articles for all different types of magazines and newspaper Sunday editions. In his third year of college, he began work on a novel, but only worked on it on and off for the 12 years that would follow. A work ethic slower than even Nakey Jakey. In 1984, he was on an assignment from New England Byways magazine to go to Derry and write a piece about the Derry Canal that was responsible for putting the town on the map in the late 1800s. In the Moose Gietti movies, Derry is known as a beaver trap community rather than a logging town. Gary started as a beaver trapping camp. Still is, am I right, boys? So Adrian asked the magazine for three weeks of expense money, and he planned to gather information on the Dairy Canal in five days and just use the other two weeks to gather material for four other regional pieces, all while living it up in the Dairy Townhouse Hotel, the same hotel that the Losers Club would eventually lodge at when they came back to battle Pennywise the following year. It was during this three-week stay that he met Don Haggerty. Don was living out the end of a three-year lease that he had in Derry while commuting up the road to his engineering firm in Bangor. Yes, the town that Derry is based on also still exists in the world of Stephen King. They're just two separate places that are very similar. By April of 1984, Adrian and Don were in a steady relationship and would often go together to drink at Derry's gay bar, The Falcon. When Adrian's stay at the hotel was up, he rented out a small apartment rather than returning to Portland, and he ended up living there just six weeks before moving in with Don. That summer would be the happy of their lives, and for Don, everything was great, other than the fact that his partner was really taking a liking to the town of Derry. See, he was planning on moving out of Derry once his lease expired, but Adrian wanted them to stay until October, because the new environment was inspiring him to be more productive than ever on his novel, and he felt for the first time in 12 years that he could finish it. So Don took him to the Kissing Bridge, an area known as a lover's hideaway and destination for graffiti and carvings, and he showed him examples of the violently threatening anti-gay markings and explains that he doesn't feel comfortable in Derry because there seem to be too many people who have what he calls the deep down crazies. Haggerty does not fully realize it, but the reason that Derry seems to be home to so many deeply hateful people is another phenomenon caused by it, known as the Derry disease. In actuality, it's more of a curse than a disease, but Derry disease sounds better because of 
alliteration. Ever since the creature It's crashed in Derry millions of years ago, it's influenced certain inhabitants to do truly evil and horrible things. The victims are often social outcasts. In the case of the main characters, the Losers Club, each of them has something about them that causes the bullying. Stan for his religion, Bill for his stutter, Ben for his fatness, Eddie for his hypochondria, Richie for his glasses, Beverly for being the first to hit puberty, and Mike for his race. Sure, bullying occurs in every town, right? But the bullying on these seven at the hands of Henry Bowers and his gang was much more extreme, to the point of being life-threatening. And the dairy disease is what causes it to go to this next level. When Adrian Mellon came to Derry, the bullies that threatened the Losers Club were gone and locked away, but it infected a new class of bullies with those same psychopathic tendencies. They were Steve Dubay, Christopher Unwin, and John Webby Gartone, who was the craziest and most evil of the trio, the Henry Bowers of the group. Bowers had a disdain for all of the losers, but the one that he went after the most was Mike Hanlon, and this was because Bowers' father raised him with an outlook of racism. John Gartone targeted Adrian and Don because he had a prejudice of heterosexism, and in July of 1984, these two groups would have their first confrontation. The Derry Canal Days Festival was a week-long summer event made to honor the town's canal, the reason Adrian came to Derry in the first place. On the first day of the festival, July 15th, Adrian won a paper top hat that said I Heart Derry on it, a reference to the era of the town's inception. In the movie, as I mentioned, Derry was originally a beaver camp, so the hats are little beaver hats. I went to the Canal Days Festival in 2019 as a promotion for It Chapter 2, so I can attest to how hard it is to win. Adrian had eaten two fried doughboys smeared in honey, so he was feeling a little bit of a sugar high at the carnival. As he and his boyfriend left, they were watched by Unwin, Dubay, and Gartone, who were disgusted at their display of affection. Gartone threatened to make him eat the hat, and Adrian, perhaps due to his lack of awareness about danger, told him he could find something much tastier than the hat, which infuriated Gartone. He's talking about his, but before he could react, he was stopped by the police officer Frank Matchin. I can run you in, my friend, Matchin said, and the way you're acting, it might not be such a bad idea. Next time I see you, I'm gonna hurt you, Gartone bellowed after the departing pair and heads turned to stare at him. And if you're wearing that hat, I'm gonna kill you. This town don't need no f like you. They don't run into each other again until July 21st, the final day of the festival. Many of the carnival rides at this point are already being taken down, so Webby, Unwin, and Dubay head over to the games, and Webby tries to win the I Heart Dairy hat, but is unsuccessful in many attempts. I'm telling you, it's harder than it looks. So Gartone wants to let out his frustration elsewhere, and suggests they go drive around looking for trouble. Adrian and Don come out of the Falcon Bar after having a couple beers each, and walk past the bus station onto the Main Street Bridge around 10.20pm, when they're spotted by Steve Dubay, and Webby Gartone was especially angry to see Adrian wearing the I Heart Dairy hat. He's the first one to storm up to them and demand the hat. On this night, Adrian was not going to mess with them, and he was willing to hand over the hat in exchange for them being left alone. But Gartone had no plans of letting him off the hook that easily and socked him in the face. If my assistant high school baseball coach was there, he would have immediately got up off of one of those buckets and yelled, IN THE FACE! In actuality, there were some people down by the bus station right next to the bridge, but they did not respond to Haggerty's pleas for help, another symptom of the dairy disease. Just like how Ben, Eddie, and Beverly all tried to call for help from adults when they were being tortured by Henry Bowers and his thugs, and each was left to fend for themselves when their outcries were ignored. Don also tried getting the attention of a passing car, but Dubay pushed him to the ground while the younger Unwin kicked his stomach. As the crazy teens laughed and pushed Adrian around in a triangle, punching and ripping at him to draw blood as he bounced around, Don continued to call for help, but the only response came from a small voice, who repeated the word, help, followed by a giggle. And it happened again, causing him to peer down over the bridge where he saw a clown. His initial thoughts upon seeing Pennywise was that it looked like a cross between Ronald McDonald and Bozo, which is perhaps a reference to the fact that Pennywise's first interaction with Georgie is inspired by one of the earliest McDonald's commercials featuring Ronald McDonald. Well, hi! Isn't that McDonald's hamburger delicious? Mom told me never to talk to strangers. Well, your mother's right as always, but I'm Ronald McDonald! Absolutely spine-chilling. Pennywise offers Don a balloon and tells him, They float. Down here, we all float. Pretty soon, your friend will float too. Meanwhile, Unwin, Dubay, and Gartone are chanting, Bums Rush, over the edge, a reference to the term Bums Rush, which is used in Canada and the northeastern United States to refer to when someone is thrown out of an establishment by the seat of their pants. Uh -huh. 
getting kicked out apparently. Go. I just wanted a picture. At 10.35 p.m., the three teens threw Mellon off the side of the bridge, down 23 feet into the canal before running back to get in the car. But before retreating, the youngest of the perpetrators, Christopher Unwin, looked over the edge and saw the clown dragging Adrian to the far bank of the canal, twisting its head and grinning at him with this shining silver eyes and great big teeth. Pennywise shoved one of Adrian's arms up over his head and took a huge fleshy bite into his armpit. Haggerty heard his lover's ribs splinter before thousands of I Heart Dairy balloons appeared out of nowhere and rose up to hit the bottom of the overpass. Haggerty would later describe the strings looking like strands of white spider web, a clue about the monster's final form. Don had a moment of understanding where he believed that the clown he had seen was a manifestation of the town, Derry, and in that moment, he ran. The three boys would be sentenced for their actions that night later that year, with Garton receiving 10 to 20 years, Dubay 15 years, and Unwin, who had gone as a juvenile, six months. But no clown was ever mentioned at the trial. The situation with Adrian Mellon mirrors what happens to the real-life victim, Charlie Howard, who was attacked while walking down the street with his boyfriend, Roy Ogden, in Bangor, Maine. He was thrown into the same stream, the Kandusky, and the ages of the aggressors, 15, 16, and 17, match the ages of Unwin, Dubay, and Garton, respectively. Both the real and fictional incidents took place in July of 1984. But the incident also mirrors what Henry Bowers and his gang put Michael Hanlon through back in the 50s. In fact, when Henry escaped the sewers from Pennywise in 1958, he washed up out of a pipe under the Main Street Bridge. The 5758 cycle would end in the exact same spot that the 8485 cycle would begin when Adrian Mellon was taken by Pennywise. Let me know in the comments if there are any other It characters you'd like to see covered here on Horror History, and make sure you check that playlist on the left for everybody that I've already covered so far. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we stay inside.